So the concept of OERs has never been more important than now with the global pandemic, the need for teaching online, and I'm sure the frustration many of you are feeling since some of the resources you've used in the past pose major accessibility issues. Today we'll be going over some concepts and tools to help you find other options that may be available to you. I'm Stephanie Barrett, the Interdisciplinary Social Science Librarian at River Campus Libraries, and I'll be leading this session with my co-instructor, Kim Hoffman. We'll be joined by our moderators, Pauline Schwartzman and Allegra Tanas. Some housekeeping before we get started today. We're a fairly large group, so if you have questions, please post them in the chat. This session will be recorded and available on River Campus Library's open education page. This page will also include links to many of the resources we discussed today. Here's an overview of what we'll be covering. We'll start with the current issues with access to materials. Then we'll go over what educational resources are and how they're different from other materials. I'll show you some sites where you can find different types of OER, as well as what you may want to consider when evaluating resources. Then we'll wrap up by illustrating some examples of how OER can be integrated into your courses. So what exactly are open educational resources? This is the simplest definition I've been able to find, which is provided by SPARC, who are leaders nationally and internationally in everything open education. Note that the OERs can be any type of resource, not just textbook. Textbooks, they could include lesson plans, entire courses, multimedia, images, and much more. First, I'd like to focus on the free of cost and access barriers part of this definition. Our current issues with access have to do with how commercial publishing models are designed for profit, not for enabling student access. Institutional ebook access is not provided by major publishers such as Cengage, Pearson, McGraw-Hill, and Oxford University Press. We also have trouble getting institutional access to some popular fiction and nonfiction, as well as many health sciences texts. Students who do not or can't purchase these materials will not have any alternative access to this content. Something to keep in mind is that financial aid does not cover the cost of textbooks, and there's a high likelihood that unemployment rates will continue to rise in the United States, which will affect students of all levels. There are also limitations on what the library can do as a result of COVID-19. To protect the health of our staff and patrons, physical course reserves are not possible this semester. We'll have a reduced in-house workforce within our libraries and we're placing a 72-hour quarantine on all returned items. If you'd like the most current information on, this, on these policies, here's the link for our COVID-19 updates page. We have other pain points that have nothing to do with the pandemic, such as ebook licensing and access. First, the licenses libraries purchase, which are institutional licenses, are not the same as those you can purchase personally. So while you can buy an ebook for your Kindle, it doesn't necessarily mean that the library can purchase the same title electronically. When we can purchase an ebook license, the levels of access varies and are set by the publisher for each specific title. Levels can include one user, three user, or unlimited. Unfortunately, oftentimes unlimited access is not an option, but we do try to purchase that whenever possible, especially if we're made aware that the, the book is going to be used in a course. Also, ebooks allow different types of access, which can become an issue if we don't have unlimited access to the resource. If more students are trying to download or read the book at the same time than the license allows, those students won't be able to access that resource. Because of this issue, I often advise students to download just the chapters they need, which will preclude many of these issues. This was confusing and frustrating to me as a graduate student, and I can only imagine that our students feel the same way. I'm not saying that we shouldn't use ebooks but we should be aware that their use can pose certain challenges. 
Now we're going to do a quick exercise. Um, we'd like to know what type of access is available for text in your courses. If you could go to the Padlet, um, there's a link that we're, we're providing in the chat, and choose one textbook, um, maybe one in one of your lower level courses, or if you don't use textbooks, any resource that you use, and determine how much the book costs. Um, are there other options for purchasing or renting that book? And if you have time, um, check and see if the library owns the book. Maybe we have the physical book, maybe we just have the ebook. Um, so I'd like you to go to the Padlet and um, try to enter this information and I'll give, I'll give everybody about five minutes and then we'll see what, we, what results we get. Okay, so we'll give everyone a couple more minutes um, to try to enter in what they can and we will go over the results a little bit. So we are seeing a bit of a range in textbook costs. Looks like the most that we have so far is $260, which when it's not, not terrible. Um, not sure if anybody is finding these materials in the library, but generally what we see when it comes to um, textbooks, especially for those in STEM is that, um, and business, that they can be incredibly expensive. Um, when we get into more of the uh, social sciences and humanities, textbooks might not be used as much. So it might just be more of a quantity of lesser cost books, at least that's what I remember as an undergraduate history major. Um, so, you know, we have a range of issues, uh, a range of, um, of dif disciplines and different ways that we might want to think about how OERs can actually help us. So with that being said, um, I'm going to close out of the Padlet and we're going to get back to, um, to talking about OER. So back to our definition of open educational resources, I'd now like to focus on the permission for open use. Something we've come across a lot in the library is the conflation of the terms open access and open educational resources. While all open educational resources can be considered open access as well, the majority of open access resources are not OERs. Open access provides users with free access to materials, while OERs do much more than that. In addition to accessing and retaining open educational resources, you can also reuse them in a variety of ways, such as on a website or in a video. You can revise them by adapting, adjusting, or altering the content itself. You can remix or combine multiple OERs with or without original content to create something new. You can also redistribute and share copies at your discretion. Together, the concept of the five R's is what sets OER apart from all other educational materials. The five R's are made possible legally by the type of licensing that open educational resources have. At this point, I need to put in a disclaimer that I am not a lawyer and cannot provide legal advice regarding copyright and use of materials. However, I can pro provide you with some information about the different Creative Commons licenses. PC0 is for works in the public domain according to the laws of whichever country the work originates from. But it can also be assigned to new works where the author wishes to waive all author rights, including those of attribution. CC BY requires that if anyone shares, revises, or reuses this work, they must credit the author. CC BY Share Alike requires that if anyone else shares the work, they must license the new creation under identical terms. CC BY No Derivatives means that the work must be shared as is and cannot be changed in any way. 
These works would not be considered open educational resources since they can't be revised or remixed. And then there's the commercial, the non-commercial license, which prohibits commercial use of materials. These licenses can also be combined. So for example, you could have a CC by share like non-commercial license. There are many places to find open educational resources, and for the most part, which resource you use depends on what format you're looking for, and oftentimes what discipline you're in as well. The first format I'll cover is textbooks. OpenStax has content that is peer-reviewed and includes textbooks suitable mostly for undergraduates, um, and especially 100-level courses. The Open Textbook Library is also peer-reviewed, but these textbooks could be suitable for upper-level or graduate courses and represent a much wider variety of disciplines. I know that many of our attendees in this presentation, in this workshop, are from the Medical Center. The Open Textbook Library also has clinical textbooks, if that's of interest to you. LibreText is similar to the Open Textbook this library, although I personally find that it is not as user friendly. When it comes to books, the first two sources I'm going to talk about are openly accessible rather than true open educational resources. The Directory of Open Access Books, DOAB, is a repository open to all publishers who publish academic peer reviewed books. The second resource, OPEN, also contains freely accessible academic books, but mainly in the area of humanities and social sciences. And then there's Project Gutenberg, which would be most useful for humanities folks in history and in English. Project Gutenberg is a library of over 60,000 free ebooks, most of which are in the public domain. If you're interested in multimedia, you can find videos in Vimeo and filter for Creative Commons licensing. For images, you can use the Creative Commons search and Flickr to find content that is openly licensed. There are also larger repositories and search engines you can use to find open educational resources. OER Commons and Merlot have a wide variety of OER materials at all education levels. OASIS and Mason OER MetaFinder are both search engines focusing on open educational resources. Personally, I find that OASIS is a bit easier to use, but Mason indexes many more repositories. So you'll be, find, be able to find a lot more in there. You'll just have to do a little bit more, um, more searching to find something that might be relevant for you. When it comes to determining whether you'll use an OER in your course, deciding what your evaluation criteria will be before you begin your research will definitely save you time. This graphic is a starting point for what you may want to consider. Relevance is the most obvious starting point, um, but you may also want to consider accessibility in terms of ADA compliance and user experience as well as how accurate the material is, especially if the resource isn't peer reviewed and ensure you understand exactly what kind of licensing the materials are under. If you'd like to see a much more detailed rubric, you can go to this link, which is, will also be placed in the chat. So at this point, uh, I would like to open it up for everyone to try a little exploration and see if there is something that might be relevant for you. Um, it might be kind of hard to see these resources, but I wanted to make sure that you could uh, kind of see them all, whether you're interested in textbooks, books, um, multimedia, or uh, some of the general search engines. Um, all of these resources could be pertinent dependent, depending on what you're looking for. So we'll give you all some time. Um, you can feel free to uh, message, any of us with questions will be looking at the chat um, if you're having issues uh, or don't know where to start. 
and um, we will we'll do, we'll do this for maybe about 10 minutes or so. So it sounds like some people are having issues with OpenStax. Um, usually what I do with OpenStax is I, I first start with subject and then I kind of go from there. So if I'm going to go into social sciences. Um, I can see how many um, resources are available. And um, like I explained a little bit earlier, um, OpenStax really is best for, you know, kind of like introductory level courses, undergraduate, 100 level. Um, so uh, a lot of them, like there aren't that many options. So um, hopefully that clarifies things a little bit for everyone. If you want to explore something that um, is a little bit higher level, then I definitely suggest that you go to the Open Textbook Library or LibreText. And I'll ask everyone to kind of like wrap up a little bit what you're doing and we're going to kind of move on in, in another minute or so. All right, so at this point, I am going to hand over the reins to Kim Hoffman to talk a little bit about integrating open educational resources into your courses. All right, great. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so we've been getting questions in the chat. You know, people are looking for a specific book, but that's not necessarily what OER are about. It's maybe um, more helpful to think of what is the subject area? What are the core concepts of um, the class I'm teaching that might be incorporated in one of these OER? Um, I've also found through the chat, we've been looking up um, what access do we have for ebook purchase? So that, that is getting answered like as we go. So um, you may look through these books, you may look through these repositories and you find something close, but it's not perfect. It's not the traditional text that you've been using for years. Um, but that's kind of the beauty of OER is that you can take the pieces that you want and you can add to it, you can adjust, you can modify um, what the book is all about. Um, and so even more empowering for your class of students is that you can engage them in that process as well so that they really are tying together what they're learning in class, maybe they're doing some research, and then they're contributing to a living document um, that either you can keep locally and keep it more private, you know, for just class use, or you could make it publicly open to the world. And so, you know, that's a, a great boon for students. But what is necessary is a talk with students about, you know, do they want their work open? Um, there's a lot of ethical issues that, that we can address quickly, but certainly more in depth one on one. So, um, so let's just say <clears throat> that you're teaching a course on public health ethics. The textbook that you typically use, you've gone through all the venues, there's no ebook, you can't get the physical book. How else can you get the, uh, a comparable textbook that your students could use? So um, using the Open Textbook Library, let's say I found this book that Stephanie will pop up on the screen. <clears throat> um, it looks pretty good, you know, you've evaluated it, the quality is good, and that is one thing about OER that professors have really in detail evaluated. These textbooks are um, as good, if not better in some cases. Um, I know that's a myth that OER really suffers in quality. But uh, particularly with Open Textbook Library, they have other professors, other professionals reviewing these textbooks. So it's not that it's just somebody put something out there for free. Um, these are actually vetted. So, um, Let's say that you adopt this book, you think it's a good bet, it's not perfect, um, but considering um, that it was published in 2016, it doesn't cover the case studies or the data that is coming out particularly now with COVID, and that is something that you really want your students to focus on. Um, so the beauty of OER is that you can engage those students in a process where they're doing some research, they're bringing in the lessons that you've been teaching them, and they can add an entire section to this book. And so um, they're gonna bring in the current events and move this book forward. 
Um, and what a great exercise and empowerment for students that they can be part of the growing story of public health ethics in this case. Um, so another case study that we could consider is um, U.S. history. And of course, Black Lives Matter has been in the news quite a bit now and in other uh, many instances. And there's a lot of questions surfacing right now, particularly, you know, why didn't I learn that when I learned U.S. history, you know, as I was growing up? And so let's say you find this OpenStax textbook on U.S. history. Um, here you have a chance to rectify the historical record. You know, the, the hidden voices, the hidden stories of, of the black lived experience is not represented in our typical US history textbooks. They're written from a particular perspective. Um, if you are dealing with a course that really wants to dive in deep to these issues and rectify the record, um, your students again could go in and share the hidden voices. Um, really do some you know, deep dives into uh, primary materials and find those hidden stories. Um, and they can add to this book and again, um, bring history forward with a different perspective. And Stephanie, could you put that book up there too? Okay, and the little blurb underneath it. Okay, and then in the last instance, I'm gonna use a local example. I know Moriana Garcia is on the call, our biology librarian. Um, but she worked with biology professor John Holtz, and they have already adopted this OpenStax textbook on anatomy and physiology. Um, for the call for this uh, workshop, Stephanie had included a quick little video with them talking about this experience. But with many science textbooks, um, the content is great. The content is comparable, if not better. But what the com common complaint is that they typically lack the really great visuals for students to understand what is being written in text. And so what Moriana and John have done is incorporate a little bit of um, information literacy and learning on what it means to, to be an open uh, image. And so the students last semester or the semester before they were out there looking for openly licensed images of the material that was in this textbook so that they could really complement and supplement um, the text of the concepts that they were learning about. So again, the beauty of OER is that you can change these. You can make them your own. And like I said, you can use them for local instances um, or you can have them go out publicly in a new reformed um, format. Okay, next slide. Okay, those three that we saw were, were traditionally OER, um, that you could reuse them, remix them, um, all those five R's that Stephanie had talked about earlier. But as I just um, earlier talked about, there are also lots of library resources that are free to our students while they are here. But of course, it's really important for students to know that once they have graduated from U of R, they no longer have access to these materials. So they are not open in the traditional sense that you can modify them, but they are free because we have the electronic access that we have paid for. So um, I want to highlight a chapter that comes from the Open Pedagogy Approaches book. Um, it's a collection of case studies where faculty, libraries, and students are working together toward open education. And this is a great chapter. It's um, from Christian Beck, and the title is Humanities in the Open, The Challenge of Creating an Open Literature Anthology. And so what his project was, it was grant-based, but he wanted to collect <clears throat> free versions of the classical readings he wanted his students to read. Um, and so he wanted to go out onto the web and find where these classical readings uh, were available for free, because of course these were in the public domain. So he collected these materials, he created an anthology for his students, and so they could go through and, um, and, and read without having to pay for these texts themselves. So in some cases, he, he faced some challenges. Uh, there was actually a poem, The Wife's Lament, that he uh, could not find a comparable version um, translated. And so he translated a version of that poem himself. And he was allowed to do that because it was in the public domain. 
and it was educational um, fair use. So he could have simply stopped and said, hey, here's the readings. But instead, he took that open educational practice one step forward, and he had the students read through these classical texts. We're talking ancient, we're talking from 1648, um, and he wanted to bring meaning to these universal writings. Um, sometimes, you know, <clears throat> students can think, oh, well, you know, that happened back in, in ancient times, but what bearing does that have on my life now? Um, well, this professor actually brought forward um, an activity where students could bring current day um, resources and make comparisons from the ancient day to what's going on today. So just for an example, that last text there, uh, Lysistrata, um, one student wanted to analyze the strong female voices from that particular book and compare them to a Twitter feed by Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. And so that's gonna come up there. So the student did a comparison and really brought the ancient to modern day and, and did that analysis and that comparison. Um, and the annotations and the information that she gathered, um, that got attached to this anthology. And so a living document, as I said, now the next class can build upon that kind of material. Um, so yeah, so you can gather these resources just simply for readings, but um, take it one step further and engage the students to, to build something of their own, become knowledge creators. Thanks, Stephanie. So when it comes to integrating OER into your courses and um, some of the kind of case studies that Kim was talking about, she's really starting to incorporate some open pedagogy practices into, um, into open educational resources. So students are really starting to become knowledge creators. And if you're ever interested in, um, in exploring this within a classroom, you have to make sure that you're aware of FERPA. Okay, so FERPA is the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, and it protects the privacy of students' educational records. If you ever want to um, show student work publicly, incorporate um, any kind of the pedagogical practices that Kim was just talking about, uh, you'll really need to have a very candid conversation with your students about their comfortability with having their materials made publicly open um, and uh, even provide uh, room for specific students to kind of withdraw from that public, public aspect of their work. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we did touch upon FERPA. If you have more questions about that, you can always contact one of your subject librarians and we can get a little bit more in depth with that. If you are interested in open pedagogy, um, Kim, uh, who, who just spoke about open pedagogy, and, um, and one of her uh, co-editors just published a book on open pedagogy approaches. And we have a group discussion that's coming up um, on Friday, August 7th in the morning, um, where we will uh, kind of choose a chapter to read and then discuss them in small groups. And uh, yes, sorry, Kim. Definitely a whole team from U University of Rochester worked on this book as well. Uh, a bunch of us were editors and reviewers. Um, so if you are interested in this workshop, you can feel free to register using the link. Um, and I think someone will also post that in the chat. So just to kind of like cover again why we're interested in open educational resources, um, you know, we will save students time um, in accessing materials, money. Uh, we can make the materials either completely free or very low cost. Um, if students use these materials, they'll have perpetual access. Uh, they're not renting them. They're not going to go away. Um, and then there's there's also the social justice um, issues. Uh, those benefits, if you publish something that's an open educational resource, anyone in the world can use that or translate it into other languages. 
Um, research shows that learning outcomes are either the same or better when using open educational resources. And we're also going to uh, paste a bunch of citations regarding that because I know that's a, a big statement to make. Um, and then pairing uh, open educational techniques like open pedagogy, um, you know, students really end up having more agency and even be able to become creators of content. So thank you all for your time today. If you can, uh, please fill out our survey. And right now, uh, we have a few minutes. So if you want to unmute, you can feel free to ask us any questions that you might have. I, I have a statement. Um, for Stephanie and Kimberly, I just want to thank you for bringing, bringing this information to us. This is, um, I'm a little upset. I'm a faculty support person at Simon, and um, our professors really kind of want very specific books, many of which they've used in the past, and I'm finding out that we can't get them, um, at least like the ebooks or on reserves and things like that. So I want to just say thank you very much, even though this is not good news for me, and I'm sure for the faculty, knowing about this situation early is very helpful so that we can let them know exactly what's happening and have time to find some alternatives. So thanks very much for doing this. You're welcome. We're, ha we're very happy to help. And if any, any of you uh, have remaining questions about open educational resources, why you would use them, when you would use them, you can feel free to reach out to your subject librarian. And in the, in the survey link that I posted, um, you know, we are asking you, like, if you want to leave your name and email, then we can have your librarian contact you to have more conversations. Would you just post the link once more, once more in the chat? Um, the, the, the survey um, link. Right. Thank you. Hey, Melanie, I just wanted to add on, I know it's not the time to talk about this, but um, if your professors are not finding that OER that really helps their, their courses, whether it be a different level of, of you know, graduate student to undergrad or um, the, the just not covered in OER, I mean, there's always the opportunity to create your own. We don't have time for that right now, but um, that is always a possibility. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you everyone so much for spending an hour with us today. And, um, you know, I, we really hope that, uh, that this session was helpful for you and that you will find um, resources that, that might help you in the coming semesters. Bye-bye.